Hello, I'm Jeff Andrew, programmer at large for BFI South Bank, and I'm here to discuss the films of Louis Mal with Sue Harris, Professor of Film Studies at Queen Mary University of London. Uh, we'll be looking at clips from three of Mal's films, Lift to the Scaffold, La Combe Lucien, and Au Revoir les Enfants, uh, which are now available to watch on BFI Player. Louis Mal, who was born in 1932 and died in 1995, was a near contemporary of the French New Wave directors. Um, he was a meticulous craftsman with an, uh, an enduring curiosity about the world. And he was a very versatile filmmaker. He worked in fiction and documentary. He worked in France, India, and America. He worked with big stars, Jean Moreau, Brigitte Bardot, Bert Lancaster, Jean-Paul Belmondo, and with non-professional actors. For one reason or another, many of his films proved quite controversial. Uh, and certainly La Combe Lucien and the largely autobiographical Au Revoir les Enfants, two groundbreaking accounts of uh, French life under the occupation by the Germans, uh, proved pretty, pretty controversial. We'll discuss why that was when we look at those clips. Uh, but for now, Sue, uh, before we look at our first clip, um, how was it that Louis Marle differed really from the, his near contemporaries in the new wave? Because he, he was, I, did, I do feel he was quite different from them. You're absolutely right, Jeff. Uh, in terms of age, he's their direct contemporary, but um, he came to uh, the industry and to, to filmmaking very differently. Um, on the one hand, actually attending film school for um, when he was young, although he didn't complete his, um, his full degree there. In the 1950s, th those who would become the new wave directors were busy in journalism, in criticism, in writing for Cahiers du Cinéma, which was established in 1951, and in very involved in the Cine Club movement, he was someone who was already out there um, gaining uh, experience as a filmmaker, notably uh, working with Cousteau um, on his documentary, filmed from the Calypso boat and about, about the underworld, if you like, uh, the, the ocean. And so, before they had even begun to make films, Mal already found himself a recipient, a co-recipient, but of a Palm d'Or and of um, an Academy Award. So he was kind of a big name already in the 1950s. And the, the directors of the new wave were progressively making their films towards the, um, towards the end of the decade, but he was already underway. Yeah. And it's, it's a very a, different kind of um, itinerary from them. It's interesting that uh, when, when they won the Palme d'Or, I think uh, Jacques Cousteau, who was by far the more famous of the two at that time, uh, went up and collected the award by himself. Uh, but actually, Mar I mean, Cousteau did um, invite Marl to make another film with him, uh, but... Marl decided, especially after working as an assistant to Robert Bresson on A Condemned Man Escaped, that he wanted to really get on with making his, his own films. He did apparently uh, tout around a rather autobiographical script, uh, which, as he pointed out uh, many years later, would probably have got made had it been two or three years later when the French New Wave had really got started, but it was turned down. So uh, he, he, he decided to do an adaptation of a novel, a thriller, uh, called Lift to the Scaffold. And uh, let's have a look at that clip now. Bien <laughs> couché. <laughs> Juliette avait un nid. <rire> Je 
Julien. Je t'aurais cherché partout. That was from Lift to the Scaffold, made in 1957 by Louis Marle. Um, and I chose the clip really partly because um, I wanted to include as many characters in this, in this clip as possible, because the film has multiple narrative strands. The, uh, the, I suppose in one sense, the main one is about a man who tries to commit the perfect crime. He kills his boss in his office and then realizes that he's left some incriminating evidence, which will make it a very imperfect crime. So he goes back into the building. But unfortunately, while he's in the lift going up to the top floor, uh, the power is switched off and he gets stuck in the lift. Which, and so he has to try and escape from that. Um, he was supposed to be meeting his lover, the dead man's wife, played by Jean Moreau. And so she is wondering what happened to him. Uh, she thinks, why hasn't he turned up for our meeting? And she wanders around uh, Paris, largely to the strain of music by Miles Davis, although not in this clip. And then there are the people who, while the man is stuck in the lift, there's a young couple who steal his car and go off and uh, go off on what turns out to be a crime spree of their own. Uh, so there are, there are three strands in this in this film. And I wanted to to because it, for me, Sue, I think one of the main things about um, Lift of the Scaffold, what what has made it so enjoyable from so many people over the years, is the the, the plotting itself, which was something that uh, attracted Marl to the project in the first place. Yeah. I think your clip is really well chosen to, to show how there are, um, the action takes place mainly over a single night. And in the middle of the night, what's going on for the three different um, storylines that are underway. And we've got, as you say, the, the young couple who've gone off on a joyride and we're not seeing any evidence um, of that in this clip, but we're seeing them, the woman's drunk, Veronique's drunk on champagne, and um, her, her boyfriend Louis brooding about the situation that they're in. And meanwhile, we have Florence, uh, Jeanne Moreau, wandering in Paris. And in fact, if, if we look at what she does in the film, it's fascinating. All she does is walk around Paris all night. Um, and we watch her walking around Paris and it's completely absorbing. We're just, she, she's trying to fathom out what's going on and she's looking for Julien. And Julien, nobody else knows this, we know it as the viewers, he's stuck in this lift. In this kind of Hitchcockian kind of world where, um, I mean, the stupidity of getting stuck just between the, the floors and not being able to get out and no one knowing he's there and what's he going to do. But the drama in it, I think, is really exciting. Mm -hmm. and, and the clip you showed is just this first moment where we get a sense of, oh, there might be a way out of this. And he gets the trapdoor off and he looks down and we'll see the he lights his cigarette uh, car his cigarette box and sends it down the, the lift shaft 
and we realize, no, he's really stuck there. So the three of them are all kind of stuck at this moment in the night. We've got to a point where things have still to happen that are very pertinent oh, yeah. to how, how this will develop. But this is, this is where they all are and what's going to happen. What's fascinating is that in the original book, apparently, uh, the character played by Jean Moreau is just the dead man's wife. She's, she wasn't the mistress of the man who kills, who kills her husband. And um, so that, that's, that's why they built up this character, because basically they needed Jean Moreau's name attached to the film in order to get the finance. So they built it up and just had her wandering around. Most She's given a little bit of sort of uh, uh, monologue to, uh, to tell us what she's thinking. And at the very end, they do bring her into the plot, which was a, another complete invention for the film, not in the novel. Um, but it, in a way, it's, it's strange, isn't it? Because I think if you said to somebody, have you seen Lift of the Scaffold, the first thing they would think of would be Jean Moreau wandering around Paris at night while Miles Davis is playing on the soundtrack. You're absolutely right. And when I went back to watch the film in preparation for our conversation today, again, there were so many plot points that I'd just forgotten. You know, it's very well crafted in terms of how the pieces all fit together. But you're right. What do I remember about that film? Jean Moreau's kind of luminous face and in close up as the film begins, where we just we're just what, looking at her in very close up. And then her presence in the film, uh, and as you rightly say, accompanied by this very languid score from Miles Davis that was um, pretty much improvised while the musicians were watching the film. And it's just kind of haunting. It just kind of captures this sense of her, um, her sensuality, but also her kind of lostness, if that's the right term in the film. And she's lost in the middle of this busy city in this vibrant kind of nightlife of Paris. She's just held um, in isolation somehow. It's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, Miles Davis has such a sort of distinctively melancholy tone to his trumpet anyway. And actually what happened was that um, they, they, they shot the, the film and at, at one point in Veronique's apartment, you see, she's got a Miles Davis album, uh, LP. Uh, and it just so happened that um, Miles Davis was passing through Paris to do some, some, some uh, planes and clubs. And through his friend, uh, the writer Boris Vion, who was also a trumpet player, Miles got an introduction and spoke to Davis. And, and yeah, they did it in one session, uh, one, one, one night, late night session. So, it, and it is, it fits in with her mood, but it also very fit, fits in with the idea that this is a, a modern film noir and it's very nocturnal sort of music. Um, and it's, it, it really transforms the film, I think. Mm. Um, and it's certainly also, Mal wanted to show a modern Paris. Uh, he's not going as far as Goddard would with Alphaville uh, a few years later, but he didn't want to show the old Paris as immortalized by people like René Clair. And he wants to show that it's actually a, a city which is taking on almost American qualities at times. And they even have a motel um, mm. that they go to at one point, which wasn't a motel, I think. Um, it, I, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, we, when we start that big, as, as the camera pulls out at the beginning to, to show us where we are, we're, it's this very kind of brutal con uh, sort of office block, w lines and lines of windows that doesn't look at all Parisian. It could be sort of anywhere um, uh, on this sort of cusp of the 60s. 
And then what is this Paris? It's a place where there are little miniature um, cameras and there are fancy cars that open sideways and there are motels and, and high, you know, motorways and um, photo developing booths and, and things like that. It's, it's a it's not a traditional Paris at all. It's a place that's kind of um, turning into something more modern. That yeah. um, you know that these characters are, are are harnessed by, but they're very old fashioned characters. Yeah. They believe in love. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, I think sadly we've run out of time to, in speaking about this film. But let's move now from modern Paris to the French provinces, uh, basically southwest France in 1944, uh, which is the setting for Marl's 1974 film La Combe Lucien. C'est pour vous. Jean-Bernard et Betty partent demain matin. C'est leur soirée d'adieu. Je voudrais amener France. Vous êtes fou. France est très fatiguée. Si elle ne vient pas, c'est vous que j'amène chez mes amis. Et il y en a qui n'aiment pas beaucoup les Juifs, Monsieur Horn. Okay, that was from La Comme Lucien, um, in which, uh, in the clip, you saw the young Lucien, um, who is a, a, pe a peasant boy, um, who has become, uh, he's been taken under the wing of uh, the local Gestapo, really, uh, and he's become a collaborator uh, with, with the Germans and with the collaborationists. Um, and he, he has also fallen, uh, rather confusingly for him, for a, the uh, daughter of a Jewish tailor who he's, he's been introduced to. And in this clip, we saw him coming to uh, invite her in a rather aggressive way to a party uh, with his collaborationist friends. Um, this was a, a, a really important film, I think, Sue, in many ways, because Although Marcel Ophüls had made uh, The Sorrow and the Pity a couple of years before, that was a documentary. This was the first fiction feature, uh, and certainly one made by a very famous filmmaker to, to deal with uh, life under the Nazi occupation and to show that a lot of people were not resistance fighters at all. Yeah, the 1970s and following you know, the, um, the release, although very limited release in France of The Sorrow and the Pity and the death of de Gaulle as this emblematic figure of French resistance. The 70s is the time when historians begin to be asked questions 
that have just not been aired uh, in the intervening years. And they begin to probe, um, I suppose, a very painful wound in French um, life, French memory, French um, self-belief about what happened in the war. Who, what, what did it mean to be a resistor? What did it mean to be a collaborator? And who did these things? And why did they do them? And so this is a really uncomfortable decade of uncovering um, of, you know, literally things that had been buried, mm. repressed in popular memory. And to make a film about a collaborationist someone who, who was not on the side of the resistance goes counter to the historical narratives and the filmic narratives today. And I think films like Melville's Army of Shadows and these kind of films, it goes against that mythology. And it also, I suppose, it forces viewers to look through a, a fictional lens at um, what people's motivations might have been to, uh, to to behave in certain ways or to to adopt certain positions, and I think what the film shows us is that the decision that is taken by Lucien Lacombe to to become part of the local French Nazi wing, if you like, the police, the milice. It's not motivated by anything political or philosophical or, or not even financial. It's, it's kind of he falls accidentally into this and, and he gains some sort of identity through it. Absolutely. Marl was very concerned not to be judgmental. And in fact, the first thing that we see uh, Lucien doing, he, he wants actually to join the resistance, but is told he, you know, he's too young and, you know, they don't want him yet. Uh, and, and then, he, as you say, he falls in with the collaborationists. And yes, he, he likes the power it gives him. It gives him a certain, it certainly gives him some money, some new clothes. And, 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 and it also, because he is a member of the underclass, it, it sort of allows him perhaps to take a little, you know, to give back some of what he'd been getting from other people. Um, but it's, it's interesting. I, and this clip, I think, is fascinating because uh, Lucien is somebody, he's most unsophisticated. And he's not even aware of what he's doing. So at the same time as being a, a collaborator, he's also falling for a Jewish girl. Uh, and here we're seeing that, you know, he, he wants a bit, if, he's, if, he, if he can't get a by sheer charm, then he's going to use aggressive means to do it. And I love the way that Marl just has him come in and then he sits on the piano keyboard. Mm. which is such an act of violence in a way against this very sophisticated family, um, mm. very cultured family. Uh, and he doesn't really understand how he relates to them at all. He doesn't. And at this point in the film, I mean, the reason he's in contact with this Jewish Horn family is that um, the father is a tailor and has made him a suit, up, has been coerced by, by the contacts in the Milice to make him a suit. And the suit is a kind of awkward looking thing. And in this scene, Lucien comes back in and he's in a different suit. He looks more fitted to the part of um, both the, I suppose, the, the power of the, the position he has, and also as a, a potential suitor for France. He, he looks more the part and we, we see straight away that, that he cannot, he is from a different world, a different class, a different 
worldview from these people in whose orbit he is. So he can't do the right thing. He tries to give the grandmother the flowers and she won't take them. Um, he, he understands some of the sadness and regret being um, expressed by Horn about, about what's happened to their lives, this complete dispossession of life and a future for him in France. And Lucien says, here, have some flowers. I brought you flowers. Yeah. Yeah. And um, he has no skills. He, but we, we get that sense and we get it again from Horn throughout this relationship. He can't put him back in his place because he is so powerful. And his, his attempt to do that, not by saying you can't take my daughter, she's Jewish, but he says she's tired. You know, you can't do that. She, um, ple he's he's pleading. Please don't do that. And and Lucien, you're right. He 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 desecrates this beautiful space of their 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 safety, really, in which yeah. they're playing Beethoven and being together quietly. He just disrupts it. Yeah. And everything will go wrong now. Yeah, it's uh, one of the keys to this film, I think, is this incredible performance by Pierre Blaise as Lucien. Uh, the, the film is largely uh, um, cast with non-professional actors, and he was certainly uh, somebody in many ways rather like the character he was playing. He was a, a farm boy who was very good at killing chickens, but didn't really didn't really have any sophisticated sense of politics or he'd never apparently seen a movie before you know and and Marl really uses that very well and it's and it ties in a bit I think with his he did half the time he was also making documentaries and mm -hmm. and he was very concerned with authenticity and um, I think that comes up actually in, in the next clip we're going to see, uh, which is from a 1987 film, Au Revoir Les Enfants, also set in 1944 in the provinces. Uh, and the authenticity here is even more important for reasons we'll discuss in a moment. What are they doing? They're going to be able to do it. They're going to be Monsieur Meyer vient ici depuis 20 ans. Je peux pas me mettre à la porte quand même. Toi, le Loufia, ferme-la. Si je veux, je peux faire révoquer votre licence. Hein? Collabo. Tais-toi, François. Tu vois qui a dit ça C'est un enfant. Il ne sait pas ce qu'il dit. Nous sommes au service de la France, madame. Oui. Ce garçon nous a jurés. Mais allez-vous-en. Je n'avais pas le droit. Dignoble ce que vous faites. Pas du tout. Bravo, la milice. Vous êtes monsieur tranquille. Ils ont raison. Les juifs à Moscou. Vous m'avez compris Foutez les camps Voilà. On se retrouvera. On peut dire ce qu'on veut Il y en a qui sont bien. Il a fait ça pour vous épater. Oh. On n'est pas juif, nous. Il manquerait plus que ça. Il y a ton C'est pas un nom juif Les Rénacs sont alsaciens. On peut être alsacien et juif Fichez-moi la paix. Les Rénacs sont très catholiques. Si vous entendez. Remarquez, je n'ai rien contre les juifs. Au contraire. À part les Blum, bien entendu. À celui-là, ils peuvent le prendre. Julien, tiens-toi droit. Yes, so that was from Au revoir les enfants, uh, which in many ways, um, I mean, many of Mal's films were very personal to him. Um, in that he was curious about the world they were portraying. But this was particularly personal in that it was based on an event from his own childhood. 
he was uh, like Junia in the film from a very privileged background and he was sent to a boarding school along with his brother and um, at that school there were several Jewish boys uh, being hidden by the priests uh, and in this clip we've just seen uh, his friend Jean Bonnet has been invited by Julien's mother and brother to join them for lunch. Um, it's a sort of special visiting day. And uh, of course, Jean is Jewish and he knows it, but uh, Julien's mother and brother don't know it. Julien has found out that Jean is Jewish. So it's a, it's a scene with a lot of tension, I think, um, but also tells us a great deal about, again, about life in France under the Germans. Wouldn't you agree, Sue? Mm. Interesting that both of these films are set in 1944. And with La Conblution, it's set from June 1944, after the D-Day landings, when actually Julien's alignment with collaboration is just absurd. We are, we, within two months, Paris will be liberated and the war is moving to a close. This takes us back to, to the start of 44, to January. In the, this very um, wintry kind of colorless world of the boarding school. And when, when Julien's mother comes to visit, she is a colourful kind of um, vibrant person who takes them out of this boarding school. We don't see anything really outside of the boarding school until this scene. And she takes them into this restaurant and you just have this sense of the normality of life going on, a certain class of life, a certain kind of bourgeois life where, you know, there's food in the restaurants, there's wine on the table, there's well-dressed people round and about. And there are actually these sort of officer um, German soldiers at off duty, sitting, getting drunk and flirting with the mum. And into that intrudes this, this eruption of violence, which is these black clad, beret wearing milice, the, the French police and, and their presence is so sinister, so sinister. We know, we know from the, the children that um, Jews are being persecuted. We know that because, because Jean Bonnet is in hiding. Um, and as, as you say, we, we, we know that already in the film. But here we get a sense, the menace that comes through as these, these men walk into the restaurant, start asking people for their papers, and then move between being polite to an elderly man who's eating his dinner, vos papiers, you know, we'd like your papers, to then talking down to him, tutoying him, sort of, dis donc toi, you know, and then talking in the same way to the maitre d' at the hotel, and then directing that venom out into this room. And what we see, it's really interesting, is people's commentary, people kind of coming in and, and we get a sense of what side people are on. And it, 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 it builds and builds and builds until the German officers, a bit drunk, are like, we're sick of this get out of here, leave us alone, you know, let us eat our dinner in peace. And leaves, what, and what's interesting, I suppose, and this is very characteristic of Mal, is that we are positioned with the young boys to understand what's going on. And we have a sense of their complicity, what they know, but also what they're learning and what they don't quite understand. And it's fascinating. I think uh, given Mal's personal history and drawing on p memories from, a, from 40 plus years earlier, we get a sense of that, what it, what it must have been like to live through that time at his age. Yeah. 
No, I mean, it, it really feels incredibly authentic. And, and at the very end of the film, we even hear Louis Malle's voice. I, I won't, it's not a spoiler, I won't say more than that. But it's fascinating. He did repeatedly turn to this idea of uh, the world, the adult world being viewed by children. And so you have these innocents learning about corruption and, and compromise. Uh, the, it's fascinating, this sort of, he, he really shows you that nothing is black and white, just as Lacombe Lucien was not a, a villain as such. And the way that in that film, he mal dealt with the banality of evil. In this, there's a whole range of, I mean, I, I think the, the, the mother who says, you know, that, she likes Jews, except for Leon Bloom. Um, but at the same time, she's horrified when her son suggests that they might have Jewish blood in the family. Um, and it's, it, it feels, the, I think with Marl, his best films are so subtle and nuanced and they feel so, so true to life. And obviously in this case, he was drawing on his own experiences. So that comes out even more. Um, Again, of course, he's always, he's, so many of his films deal with the effect of society on individual behavior and how, and how individual behavior is shaped and compromised and swayed by the events around that individual. Um, it's, I think these are wonderful films myself. And I think that, um, that moment of, you know, formation of, the identity of of the person and filmmaker Mal would become the, the the significance of the war period to that I think is, is underlined in both of these films because between La Lucien and Au Revoir Les Enfants he's mainly working in America working in English language but both his the French films about the war bracket these other the, these other interests, and yes, as fiction films, I think to go back to what you said, in both of them, he's working with non-professionals, he's working with young people, he's working in that observational documentary mode, and yet he's drawing on this this rupture in in his own life and in in French national life and again being part of that conversation in the 70s and on into the 80s about how do we deal with this what do how do we account for what happened and, and what we did in it even if we were innocent children who didn't quite understand what was happening how did that mark us as French yeah. citizens and adults. It took him a long time to get round to making Au Revoir Les Enfants. Uh, he toyed with uh, the, writing a script around the time of uh, Lacombe Lucien, but he'd been, this had been preying on his mind for a long time uh, because he felt that this moment um, in, his, in his school life, uh, um, again, we, we, won't, we won't give the spoiler away, um, but uh, the film does build up to something which which Mal thought changed his life, mm. and and that was because he was from a very privileged background and had been you know okay he suffered cold floors and bad food in the school but compared to what life was out what life was like outside the school he he was quite sheltered from the war, and then something happened which made him aware of the seriousness of of events around him and he said that that's what turned him into the person he was he became a rebel he would ask questions mm. and it's what made him in the end want to become a filmmaker because he carried on asking questions and I think in in certainly in these three films we see his development with 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 um Lift to the scaffold as a, as a master craftsman, somebody already incredibly talented who knew how to use cinema, but then going into something far more personal, far more probing, uh, far more, I don't know, well, far more true to life, I suppose. Mm. Well, I'm afraid that's probably all we've got time for. Uh, so first, uh, thanks to you, Sue, for your contribution to this. It's been fascinating. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks to everybody for watching. 
And I do uh, would lastly remind you that you can watch Lift to the Scaffold, uh, La Combe Lucien, and Au Revoir Les Enfants on BFI Player. And I really recommend you do because they're great films. Thank you.